Take it away. All right. Well, I guess you want to pass these around to no, Well. What did you want to do? You want to thank Just Father? Look at them. <laughs> thank you, Father. Yeah, yeah look at them. Awesome. Awesomely thanks. Thank so. you, Fathers. Thank you, Fathers. Thank you, fathers. You know, one of the reasons that um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not shy, as you guys know, but this is not my comfort zone whatsoever, um, right here. Um, but Father's Day to me means um, so many things that I just wanted to share. Um, just a personal witness to um, what I would just consider the word Father. And when I think of Father, it, 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 it's, it's all wrapped around what I think of our Heavenly Father. And anything that I've ever seen in my earthly father or my husband father, it's just I feel like glimpses of our Heavenly Father. So um, I was... Uh, basically the reason I wanted to do this was I, I wanted to but I also want to honor fathers and give thanks for your hard work, for your patience, for your strength, for your courage, and for your refuge that you give your families. But most importantly, I want to give thanks for our Heavenly Father, who I see in my husband and the experience I have with my own earthly father. When I think of Father, these descriptions come to mind. Faithful, kind, full of grace, loving, and steadfast. So, in 2004, I, um, Sam and I were living in Asheville, North Carolina. And I think I shared a little bit of this with you guys. But um, I was very homesick. And my father and my mom are divorced. So my father had spent Christmas by himself that year. And... Of course, as a you know emotional Latina, I start crying. I'm like, I can't believe my dad spent Christmas all by himself. And Sam's like, I can't take seeing you like this anymore. And he said, That's it. We're going home. And I said, Really? Don't say it if you don't mean it. And he said, Yes, we're going home. And you know, we prayed about it, and we put our house up on the market, and it sold in 11 hours. Mm. And um, we made a profit, and we had only lived there for eight months. Um, you know, we, my dad and I started talking more. He was so excited because not only was I coming home, his grandchildren were coming home. And um, so we started just talking more and more, and it just became this wonderful thing. We started talking every day about just the different things that could happen, and yada, yada. Well, Sam and I, you know, we get back here. Everything was pretty crazy because my dad owned a very old building in Riverside, very, very old, and it was kind of falling apart. And he said, y'all can live upstairs until you get a place. We're like, great shoved all our boxes up there, literally had three Mexicans move us. It was a messy ordeal. And um, my dad threw a barbecue the next day to welcome home his daughter. It was just a beautiful thing. Um, day three, my children were watching a baseball game on his lap, and I was just in heaven. Day four. I get a phone call from my husband who had gone back to North Carolina. And he said, honey, I'm so sorry, your dad died last night. I said, what? Because I was at my friend's house here in Jacksonville, and he was in Pelican. I said, you know, of course, shock, shock, shock. Well, my dad passed away four days after we moved back. He died in his sleep. I even asked them to leave him. I said, please leave him right where he's at. I got to see you know, me being medical, I'm like, I gotta see what happened, like I know anything. And um, so anyways, he was in a pair of scrubs he had stolen from a hospital, because he was a doctor, it's the property of hospital, and he was asleep peacefully with his hand behind his head, and just asleep. And it, it was, yes, it was sad, and it, oh, I had so much peace seeing him lie there. I was like, oh my God, he's like sleeping, God, this is like unbelievable. So anyways, my dad was um, from Dominican Republic. He was raised by a, a cattle man, a man who raised cows. 
and they were very, very poor. And my dad was always told by his grandfather, for some reason, his grandfather told him since he was a little boy, he said, you are a doctor. You are a doctor, you are a doctor. So much so, I wasn't expecting to share this piece, but so much so that when he was 12 years old, one of the poor village people came to him and they said, I have a boil right here. And he said, I'm a doctor, okay, at 12. So the guy's like, okay, he's a doctor. So he pulls his pants down, my dad goes with a knife, to lance a boil on this guy's leg, the guy faints. My dad runs away because he thinks he killed him. Okay, so that was his first experience of being a doctor. But many times when he talked to me about Dominican Republic, he would tell me, he's like, yeah, we would, because back there, if you're a doctor, you do surgery, you deliver babies, you do whatever, right? So he would tell me, yeah, I did a surgery and uh, they gave us a goat as payment. I was like, a goat? I was like, Dad, what'd you do with the goat? He's like, nothing. It's like, the doctor and I split it in half. I took half the goat, he took half the goat. You know, and he would just love these stories. So when he was a doctor here in the States, he kind of brought that flavor to his patients. Um, they, um, when he died, we were blessed with like the most amazing wake where people would come and just share these funny stories about how they would bring in my dad cake and they would bring him in baskets because he was in Callahan for 28 years and they would bring him stuff and that stuff, I mean like he would stop the patient he's seeing and he would go eat that piece of cake. Like it was so important to him. And so Callahan really embraced my dad. Um, they called him more of like, I guess a poor people doctor. He liked to call himself a country doctor which he was not country, they couldn't even understand him partly because of his thick Spanish accent. Um, he was just gracious and generous. You know, when, we, when he passed away, we went through his files, and there's a file of patients who have paid, and there's a file of patients who owe, and the piles were the same size. And there was, and he didn't, he didn't believe in billing. He didn't believe in anything but rotary phones. He didn't believe in, uh, what else? No appointment necessary was on his door. That's just the kind of doctor he was. So, one of the other things, one of the other traits that my dad had was he he was called to the less fortunate. Not only was he like felt called to him, he felt comfortable. With him. That was his comfort zone. You put him with the doctors and the physicians, and he just was not comfortable. You put him with the homeless, and you put him with that, and he was comfortable. And one of his favorite things to do is he would go to Dominican Republic and he would bring back bottles of rum. And he would go to the Riverside Park down by the river and he would drink rum with all the homeless people. Okay, so he would get <laughs> drunk with them. But I mean, it was so great because he became friends with them. And we noticed that at his, uh, at his wake, because um, it was in Jacksonville, that we had homeless people literally hitchhiking to get to Callahan to get him respects. Um, the kind of father he was, um, my dad wasn't perfect. And like I said, I'm not here to glorify my dad. Because my dad is such a little, minimal glimpse of our heavenly father. And he was, he was gifted with what he was given, his heart and his gifts. And he gifted that to us, but it's a gift from him. So I told you one of the words I think of father is grace. Well, I want to tell you a moment before grace that I felt so heavy in my life with, from my earthly father. Basically, when I was 18, I was partying, living it up, found out I was pregnant. Woohoo! Freshman in college, pregnant. My family is a strong Catholic family. Like, like my, my uncle's a cardinal in the Catholic church. Nobody gets pregnant like this. So I kept it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> of course, for as long as I could. Well, one of the phone calls I get after they find out is my brother. I love my brother. Don't judge him. But he says to me, you need to go to confession right now because that child is, needs to be adopted out. You need to go to a pregnant women's home. Da -da 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 -da. And I'm like, no, already figured it out, Victor. I'm raising this kid, I'm doing it by myself, and we're just going to find a way. Da -da -da -da. So all that advice came my way. My mom, ay, Dios mio, right? My dad. Dad, I'm so sorry. 
but I want you to know, this is my conversation, but I want you to know I have Medicaid signed up, I'm gonna get scholarships for school, you don't have to worry about it. And he said, he's calling Mijita, which means my little girl. Mijita, what's done is done. I am here for you, whatever you need. So anyways, that moment of grace, I was able to pour on him later on in life, and I told him the same thing. I said, you told me, whatever you need, I'm here. So I told him the same thing. So I was able to share that with him and give him much gratitude for that. I don't need you too long, I'm sorry. So I put a scripture in here. The thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. I cried out, I cried out unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me uh, out of his holy hill. Psalms 3, 3, 4. One more, very tender. I have lots of tender memories, but this was a big one for me. I had gotten a little kid. Okay, I loved animals. I was obsessed with animals. I got a little kitten, and I was holding my kitten, and this golden retriever in the neighborhood would run free, and he thought it was a squirrel. So he jumped up on me, and he rips it out of my hand, and he proceeds to tear apart my little kitten in front of me. Okay, yes, yeah, very traumatic, whatever. Held it to my brand new Sunday dress that my mom had sewed, by the way, okay? Ran home with this bloody kitten, right? And I go, Dad, Dad! And he looks and he goes, oh my gosh. He proceeds to go to every neighbor's house and he says, please come. We're having a funeral. And he, <laughs> and he invited every neighbor to come. So all my neighbors are standing out there in our yard. My dad digs a hole, okay? We bury my little Smokey. He puts the dirt over it and he goes, everybody bow your heads. <laughs> Let's have a moment <laughs> for this cat. And you know, it's just such a, an, an unbelievable gift and such a moment that could have been something. I just laughed so hard because I remember looking around and I was so sad. But looking around all these neighbors, like, they didn't even know my cat. Like, <laughs> like what are they doing here? So anyways, um, my dad was known in um, Callahan. He, you know, I was his secretary for a long time at his, at his practice. He had one in Jacksonville, one in Callahan. But he was just known. He would call every single person his friend. They came in, it was, hello, my friend. Hello, my friend. So much so that it's on his tombstone in Callahan. Um, he taught me about forgiveness. Um, my dad, uh, literally, I cannot tell you, and Sam is a witness, people would rob from him. People would take advantage of his kindness, all of those things. And my dad would always tell me, I'd be like, Dad, don't let people take advantage of you. And he goes, it's okay. They need it more than I do. And that was his statement to me all the time. This is what we heard all the time. If he got the wrong dish at a meal, he's like, it's okay, I'll eat this. It was always like that. It would drive us crazy. But it was just such a beautiful thing that he had in him. He also had, um, uh, he would reach out to a lot of just different people, of course, in his practice. And one little boy in particular um, lived out in Riverside. And since he was a little boy, his mom left him with his father. So his name was Shay. And Shay had a lot of psychological major stuff going on. And my dad really befriended Shay. And he would have Shay over and Shay this and Shay that. Well, when Shay became a teenager, he was very, very rebellious and um, really a mess. And he and his friend, my dad's one favorite thing in the world was his luxury. It was his 1986 black Mercedes Benz. Those two teenagers egged my dad's car, okay? And my dad knew it was Shay. Well, I don't think a day went by before Shay felt so horrible that he came up to my dad. He said, Dr. Kenya, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry my friend and I egged your car. And he said, Shay, it's okay. I so, and that'll come back to where I'm headed with, with this. My dad, when he died, I remember having a conversation with him, and I said, Dad, when you die, where, where, where do you want to be buried? Do you want to go back to Dominican Republic? Like, what do you want to do? And he goes, no. He goes, I want to be buried in the community cemetery in Callahan with all of my black patients. So when I found out that he had died that, that very moment, 
I have his landlord, who is a bit of a, a jerk, excuse me, coming up to me saying, I have the most beautiful plot of land in Callahan. Victor will get my plot in my family lot. And I'm like, no, wait a second, wait a second. I said, my, I'll talk to my brother because that's not what my dad told me he wanted. Well, what did he tell you he wanted? He wants to be buried in the um, community cemetery in Callahan. Well, he can't be buried there. That's a black cemetery. Well, that's what he wanted. Okay. So anyways, this little tug of war throughout the first days of my dad's death were real because my brother was trying to be Mr. Mr. Businessman, not ruffle any feathers. And then we had this very strong figure who had been in Callahan for a long time saying, he can't be buried there. You will not do that. He does not deserve to be buried there. That is a poor black cemetery. This is Dr. Pena. So then finally we're in the funeral home director's room and we're talking and Sam is there and Anna, my sister's husband, is there. And he finally turned on us and he goes, you know what? It's not that he can't be buried there. It's that the people won't let him be buried there. I said, which people? He said, the black people. I said, really? So right then when we were talking, Sam's like, I'll be back. Sam goes with my, my brother-in-law. They go to this little cemetery, which I wish y'all could see it. It is the most humble little place, okay? It is adorable. They go walking up to the cemetery. They're trying to find anybody who they can talk to. Well, no joke, straight out of a movie, in walks this guy. It's this, it's this black man in an ivory suit, okay? With an ivory top hat and a cane. And he's walking onto the cemetery and Sam says, can I, can I talk to you a second? And he said, yes, of course. He said, well, my father-in-law has passed away. And I might not be getting the details exactly right, but my father-in-law has passed away. And he would like to be buried there. And he said, who's your father-in-law? He said, Victor Pena. He said, Dr. Pena. He said, you come with me. Took them to this little old lady's house. And when they went and presented their case, that little old lady who was, I guess, the head of that cemetery said, we would be honored to have Dr. Pena with us. So Sam and Todd come back, and they tell what we're going to tell. They just felt so good. It was like, you know what? We have permission. And so finally, that, that same gentleman actually turned on us, and he said, no one will come to the funeral of that. And we said, that's fine. If it's just us, then it'll be just us. So fast forward, go to the funeral, tons and tons and tons of people there. Go to the burial site. At the burial site, a few funny things happened. One, one of the homeless guys who we would get drunk with in Riverside, who had hitchhiked there, we had asked them to lower the casket. We just, we needed that closure, and they're not leaving it up. So as they're lowering the casket, he walks up to the hole all dramatically, pulls a quarter out of his pocket, and he goes, thanks, Doc. <laughs> and flicks the quarter into the hole. Okay, so anyways, when the hole's going down, his patience, found two shovels, and they all start shoveling dirt into the hole, okay? Shay, the little boy, starts shoveling hole into this dirt. Okay, well, then it got, it was blazing hot, it was June. The patients start passing it to one another, and they're shoveling dirt, except for Shay. Shay would not let go of his shovel, no matter what. And he just, I mean, I wish you could have seen him just sweating like he was, and just shoveling dirt and shoveling dirt. And it was just a beautiful sight of grace. So needless to say, he's still there. And uh, Florida Times Union got a hold of it. And so they came out and they said, we got to do a story on this. So they did a story. So two weeks after, or a week after Father's Day in 2004, an article came out um, talking about my dad. And uh, um, I brought the article and I'll if you guys want to read it later, it doesn't matter either way. I've told you pretty much the gist of it. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and the rampart. Psalms 91.4. I've got, besides Heavenly Father, Earthly Father, I have another example of grace. And of course, as you guys can imagine, it's saying, told you I was pregnant. I was 19 years old. I had an 18-month-old child. 
and I met this rough-looking, combat boot-wearing, smoking, earrings all over, tattooed up man in the courtyard of FCCJ. And, you know, we were friends, and he very quickly, when we started just building a relationship together, just took on the role of father like that. And he was 19 years old, okay? Not only did he take on the role of father, we were dating one year. And we were living here in Jacksonville. He's going to college, I'm going to college. I'm, I'm living with my parents in the kind of apartment. I get into occupational therapy school in Tallahassee, FAMU, okay? I'm there for three months. Sam goes to his dad and he says, I'm quitting school. I'm gonna go to Tallahassee and take care of Dominic while she goes to school. And his dad's like, are you crazy? You've known this girl? This is, what do you, you can't leave college. Like, what are you gonna do? But he did. He left college, moved to Tallahassee, worked at Barnet Bank, and took care of Dominic so I could finish school for two and a half years. The unfathomable, unfathomable depth of God's love settles me, breathes hope into my dread, trust into my doubts, and gives me a soft place to live. Sam, you have been a true example of a godly love for me these last 20 years. You are kind and patient and steadfast and faithful and strong. This was the example that your father gave you as well. And God gave him. God first, family next, and that's it. Your family is everything to you. I just want you to take some praise this morning to our Heavenly Father, Abba, who has graced me in his kingdom with tangible examples of his grace and love for us and for our children, who are our fathers. Happy Father's Day. I missed the chance again to help you down. That's all right.